Hi, it's Lindley Oz, and welcome to another episode of Truth Hunters, because then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What a lovely night tonight. It's cooler. The humidity is down. It's clear. You can see the stars in the sky. There's a full moon. It's absolutely, absolutely peaceful and lovely. And what a better way to spend it than to spend it with you guys talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and just talking about Bible topics and things that we think about, things that we don't really know for sure that we wonder about. So much fun by the campfire, out at night, under the stars. So I was doing a lot of thinking today, and I was thinking about you know, something that's going to sound terrible at first, but it really isn't that terrible. It's something I'm sure all of us think about from time to time, especially the older we get, we think about death. You know, like what really happens? How does it happen? And how was it that all the people that you read about in the Bible, like Stephen and Paul and Peter and James and John and all of them, They had no fear whatsoever or question about death, nothing at all. Like they just, they knew that this life here was nothing in comparison to eternity. And while I know some of you out there probably don't have fears of death whatsoever, there's a lot of people that do. And I guess it's because it's the unknown, you know? I mean, we operate on faith. And we know what the Bible tells us, but still it's unknown. It's something that we haven't ourselves yet experienced. We've had loved ones who have experienced it and they can't tell us exactly what they experience when it happens because they're not here. So it's something many of us think about. And of course, Hollywood and the obsession with spooky stories and ghost stories and things like that, that of course doesn't help you know, to not have the fears of the unknown. So I was thinking about it. I wonder what it's like, you know, when we really die. Well, I know the Bible compares it to being asleep. It talks about being asleep and being awake and so on and so forth. So I was just kind of doing some deep thinking. And these are really things that I can't necessarily find in the Bible for sure. But just something I was thinking about, it's like, okay, so we have dreams, we dream about things, and when we dream, our dreams seem very realistic to us, and then we wake up. So I kind of wonder, you know, in heaven, the time is different than it is here. The Bible talks about um, how to God, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. So I was thinking about when we dream, if any of you have studied dreams, you probably know this too, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it talked about how you can dream so many dreams and it seems like an hour when it was actually just like a few minutes or a few seconds, but yet it seems like it was hours upon hours or maybe an hour. So I was thinking like in God's time, all of these years that we live here on this earth is such a short time. In fact, the Bible calls it just a vapor that lasts for a moment. So I wonder, you know, when we leave this world, if we kind of just wake up, you know, even David wrote a Psalm and he talks about when I wake up, I'm with you. He says, when I wake up, I'm still with you. And he's talking about dying. And then the Bible talks about awaking, waking up, going to sleep, and so on and so forth. So I was kind of wondering, you know, maybe when we pass on, like I just said, we just kind of wake up and we're with the Lord. So that's kind of a comforting thought, like as if this life we're living here is just kind of a high-tech dream of some sort which was also making me think about other things. You know, people talk about, well, when we're with the Lord, there's no sadness. So how do we not have sadness if we have loved ones and family members that didn't make it to heaven? How would we not miss them and be sad? And people say, well, they're forgotten and so on and so forth. But what if it's possible that 
because this is like some high tech dream, so to speak, that when we wake up, we're with the Lord and some of those people who didn't make it didn't really exist to begin with. They were just, well, they existed here in this realm, but in the heavenly realm, they didn't really exist to begin with. They were just part of a dream. I don't know. I just think about some really crazy stuff sometimes and just wonder. And then I thought I might just share it because it was something I was thinking about. Now, don't misquote me. I'm not saying that's the gospel. I'm just talking about some of those deep, really deep things that I think about sometimes and just kind of wonder because I'm one of these people that just thinks constantly. I don't think my brain turns off that often. And I just think about some of the mysterious things that are unknown and just ponder them. So it's like I said, like, you know, the ones who don't make it, who are loved ones, they exist here in this realm, but they don't really exist in a different realm or a different dimension or something like that. Well, then what about their dead bodies? Well, those things exist in this realm, but not really in the heavenly realm. So I guess, I don't know, that would be one way to think about it, like as to how we don't have sadness and suffering over our loved ones who did not make it to be with the Lord. You know how you'll have a dream and when you wake up, I mean, there's some dreams I guess you remember clearly, but overall, you'll kind of more often than not completely forget the dream. Something later on in the day might trigger something that makes you remember the dream, but it's still not totally clear. You don't remember everything about it and then it's just forgotten. Kind of interesting. Kind of sounds like that movie, The Matrix or something though. <laughs> so I was also studying in the Bible today. I was studying about the rich man and the poor man. And then I was studying James chapter three about our words. And I've come to the conclusion when I study the rich man and the poor man, because it's interesting, Lazarus is rooted in the word that means to help or helper. And I think of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the helper. And if you really study the words about that story, and it talks about how he just wants a drop of water on his tongue. And there's this great chasm between where Lazarus is and the rich man. It's an impassable gulf. Well, a lot of the words I've studied to do with the very end and the tribulation are rooted in the same word, chasm and passable gulf. So we're at the very, very end, right? So when we read the Bible and we hear the word rich and poor and wealth and things like that, a lot of times when it's talking prophetically about the end, it's referring to people who are rich in the things of the Lord or rich in knowledge, or of course, like in Revelation chapter three, the last church, it's using riches and wealth to really describe these people who think that they know everything. They think that they know exactly how it's all going to happen. They think they really know the Lord, but they really don't. And so it's like, they don't really know anything. So Lazarus, when I'm studying that, and then the rich man, and we're talking about not the same Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. It's a parable Jesus talks about in relation to Lazarus, who's a very poor man. He's just begging for even crumbs from the rich man's table. And here's Lazarus who's suffering and he's begging for these crumbs. Well, Lazarus represents the people of the Lord or the, the followers, you know, the people, the common people. And so of course, Lazarus dies and he's being comforted in Abraham's bosom. Abraham means father of a multitude. Bosom means in the chest, like right here, like your heart. So I think what it's representing when you think about the word helper to do with Lazarus, this name and Abraham's bosom, he's holding Lazarus in his heart 
And then the rich man represents those of us here at the very end who are suffering and in torment and God's wrath, his anger, his uh, stripping away of our flesh. And we're looking back at all the people of the early church who had the power of the spirit and they were doing and experiencing all these great and mighty miracles. And here we are at the very end, tormented, pleading and begging for just one drop of the water, the power of the spirit, but we don't see it. But yet here you had the early church. Remember the impassable gulf, looking back where they had the power, but we've been stripped of those things for a time here at the very end. And we're pleading for that and we can't have it. So it talks about how he just wants one drop of water on his tongue because he's experiencing burning. So then you go to James chapter three and it talks about the tongue and the fire to do with the tongue. So then you go to Mark chapter seven, beginning with verse 14. And Jesus is talking about how basically it's not what goes into us that desecrates, profanes, or defiles our temple, but what comes forth from our heart and out of our mouth. And then you read through the whole Bible. What do we make our covenant with? Our heart and what we speak. You know, it says like confess the name of the Lord. So when we make a false vow or a false covenant as seen in the Ten Commandments, taking the name of the Lord in vain, the name meaning Mark, name in Hebrew means Mark Memorial Monument, making a false vow or a false covenant with the Lord, not being sincere about it, which Jesus talks about those different types of people in Matthew 13. He compares them to seeds and birds and stony ground and um, some fell by the wayside and so on and so forth. So you think about that. So I really feel like the rich man, the poor man is talking about those of us at the end you know, who just want a little drop of the power of the Holy Spirit, a little drop of water on our tongue because we're thirsty. And Jesus compared the Holy Spirit to the water. He, you know, told the woman at the well, he said, I have living water. So water throughout the Bible represents seed, like in Hebrew, the word water means seed and wasting water or urine. And then we know the rain represents the Holy Spirit, the outpouring or the power of the Spirit. Jesus compares the Spirit to the water. And we know when Jesus was pierced in his side or his rib cage that it talks about blood and water flowing out. So, like I said, it just seems to me that that whole parable is about those of us at the end just wanting one little drop of the power of the Holy Spirit. So some things that are very noteworthy and interesting about the rich man and the poor man, it's in Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. It says, now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. So what I find interesting about that is number one, he's clothed in purple and fine linen. Now those are some of the qualities in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 of the harlot church. It says, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. Now gate also means prison and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried. Now you'll notice the poor man was just carried off to Abraham's bosom, but the rich man was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. 
but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. So very interesting, going back up a few verses, and it says in verse 24, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. Now, interesting, the word tip means the farthest bounds, uttermost parts, end, the highest extreme of the earth or of heaven, the end of the earth. The ends of the earth in the Bible are in reference to the last 3,500 years, the end. Okay, so it says extremity, the uttermost, the tip, the top part, but it also says the end. So the tip of his finger. Now let's look at what finger means. Finger means 10, the 10 commandments, the end, the 10 commandments, finger 10. Remember when Jesus wrote with his finger in the sand. Okay. And I did a video on that. He's referencing the 10 commandments. Now Jesus further confirms that that's what he's pointing to because further on down, in verse 27, it says, And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. I'm going to explain that in just a minute. In order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Now, you'll notice he has five brothers. Five is half of ten. You have five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. Okay, so you have five that are still living in apostasy and five that are walking with the Lord. Cause you have the five foolish virgins, the five wise virgins. He has five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. What is Moses famous for? The 10 commandments. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, who rose from the dead? Jesus Christ, Yeshua, rose from the dead. So they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So still, even to this day, people continue to walk in the ways of the flesh and the ways of the world, calling themselves Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, but yet they're completely living in disobedience against his commands and his teachings, following after this flesh made Jesus who is okay with sin. He's okay with all of it. You're just going to get your hand slapped and all of this when that's not what the Bible teaches. So now let's look at James chapter three, because we noticed he's begging for a drop of water on the tip of his tongue because of the flame. Okay. So it specifically says, father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger. Remember tip means the, um, the end, the extremity dip means to immerse, to immerse. Okay, to dip, to immerse. Okay, so now let's look further. It says, so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. So God's wrath is likened in the Bible unto a flame, the all-consuming fire of God. So let's look at James. James tells us a little bit more detail. It says, let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. Now I want to stop there real quick and pause because I want to make a comment about that. Those of you who are listening, who are teachers, or you get on YouTube and make videos and teach people, whatever you do, whether you are an ordained teacher or or the Lord has just called you to teach, I want you to know that that's a very, very, very serious thing. 
It is a serious thing to teach. Now, over and over in the Bible, I have found words such as rooted in one of the words gather. Okay, in Matthew 13, there's two words that say gather, but each has a different definition. One of the words for gather is rooted in the word that says to teach and to lead and to point out what the words mean and what they really intend to say. So when we teach, we are supposed to point out the words and what the words mean in the Bible. We're not supposed to teach our opinion. We're supposed to teach what the words actually mean and what they intend to say. Archery and shooting arrows is also part of teaching. Jerusalem, the teaching of peace, is rooted in archery and shooting arrows. Why? Well, arrows are defined in the Bible as the children of God. His quiver is full of them, the arrows. That's in Psalms. And also, when you sin, you miss the mark, the mark of God, the seal of salvation, the Holy Spirit. So when we teach, we're supposed to teach the words. We're not supposed to mix anything with ancient Jewish mysticism. We're not supposed to mix the teachings of the Bible with extra biblical things. We're not supposed to add to it or take away. Even Revelation talks about that. We teach what the words mean. So I just want to let you know it's a very serious thing when we teach. And when you deceive somebody, even unknowingly, there is a serious price to pay. So we need to take teaching very seriously. Make sure that you are teaching the absolute truth to people. Make sure of this. Study to show yourself approved. Study the words, cross-reference. Don't trust in uh, little notes in your Bible that some of these Bibles have or commentaries or people's opinions or books. Not even mine, not even what I teach search it out for yourself that's very important because we have gotten ourselves into a thing where basically and this has happened over many years people are afraid to study the bible for themselves they're afraid to study the prophecies they're afraid to study the book of revelation so they've relied on teachers to spoon feed it to them and that is exactly what satan has wanted because that's how we end up getting deceived because they mix truth with lies so that's not really what I was going to talk about tonight, but I wanted to make that comment. So notice it says, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment for we all stumble in many ways. Now let's look at that word judgment, what it says. It says a decree, judgments, judgment. And it says a matter to be judicially decided, a lawsuit, a case in court, determination, but it's rooted in a word. That means to separate, put asunder, to pick out, select, choose, to approve, esteem, prefer, to be of opinion, deem, think, to be of opinion, to determine, resolve, decree, to judge. Okay, and then it goes on deeper, to rule and to govern, to dispute, and then to separate, to separate, to determine, resolve, and decree, and to separate. What is God too. What does Jesus talk about? Separating the wheat from the tares. All right. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue. Now remember what we just talked about, about Lazarus, the rich man, the poor man, and the, the rich man's begging, you know, send him over here to dip his finger in water. And remember dip meant submerge or immerse or something like that. And tip meant the extremity or the end, the outermost. So that he would dip his finger in water and put it on his tongue because the flame was hot. 
So it says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles or desecrates or profanes. Remember, the end is about profaning the temple. Which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. What is the end about? It talks about the toxic wine, the poison, wormwood, the bitter poison, toxic. Right? And it's talking about the fires of hell here to do with what? The tongue. And I'll show you something else interesting. Well, let me just tell you now because I don't want to forget. So in the Hebrew context in the Old Testament, the word lip means edge of the seashore. Where do you see the serpent standing? He's standing on the sands of the seashore in Revelation 13. He's been established to stand means set up on the tongue, on the mouth, on the lips of the false teachers. So it says, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. We were originally made in the image of God, but when Adam and Eve sinned, remember, God clothed them in skin. So they went from incorruptible flesh to corruptible flesh. So then after they sinned, they were no longer in the image of God. They were in the image of the beast or the Gentile, unclean, sin nature. So it says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. How do we curse men with it? I'll tell you in a second. Who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? What's it talking about there? The fountain, the heart, fresh and bitter water. This is talking about those of us who are alleged Christians, but we have one foot in the world, one foot in the flesh. We're divided. Okay, remember it's talking about bitter water and fresh water, bitter water, wormwood the toxic poison of the false teachings of the end and the ways of the flesh. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh water. Salt water is toxic if you drink it. So now let's go back up where it says with it, verse nine, we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. So how do we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God with the tongue? By teaching deception. Because you're cursing them. You're teaching something false. You're teaching a false Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. So you have false salvation. People who are taking the name of the Lord in vain. Making a false vow, a false covenant with the Lord. So this whole teaching in James 3 about the tongue and the fire is referring to the false teachings, the false teachings. Notice it begins by talking about teachers. It says some of you ought not to teach for you will incur a stricter judgment. And then it goes into talking about the fires of hell and the tongue and cursing people. It is talking about false teaching. And when many of us learn something, even though we may not be teachers, some of us, we still repeat and tell other people the things that we've learned. And by doing so, we are teaching and we're spreading false teachings. And notice it talked about this small flame and this small fire, but yet it spreads and becomes huge throughout the whole body. 
Well, go back to what Jesus talked about. He talked about the sneaky housewife who basically sows leavening into this lump of dough and it spreads. And it's talking about the kingdom of heaven being compared to a housewife who sneaks in this leavening. And leavening always has a bad connotation into the lump of dough and it spreads and becomes huge. That's talking about the deception and the curse in the church, my friends, in the hearts of the people. What we really have to remember is we are here for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that purpose is as a servant or slave, a willing slave of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. We're not here for ourselves. I know that's hard for some of you to stomach, but you're not here for your own pleasure or your own enjoyment. You're here for God's pleasure such as the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That verse doesn't mean the joy of your own. It's the joy belonging to the Lord. We read that verse wrong. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When we're strong in him, it pleases God. It makes him happy. So God's joy is when we are strong in him. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What does that mean? It is through our weakness, our humiliation, our humility, our lowliness, less of ourselves, the stripping of the flesh, being made weak, the falling away, in which God makes us strong and returns his power to us because it is when we become weak and lowly and humble and get rid of ourselves that God can then put us back together in his image. There's a saying I wrote a long, long time ago on a blog and I've quoted it a few times. I'll quote it again. And I had a picture of a broken clay pot. It is when we are broken that God can put us back together. Are you ready to fall apart? Are you ready to let go? Let God do his great work in you. Rejoice in your suffering. We don't always understand it. We don't understand the ways of God or or things that we go through. But the Bible tells us we are supposed to offer up the sacrifice of praise. And isn't it such a sacrifice when we're in pain and we're suffering and we're in anguish, whether it be physical pain, maybe you're dealing with some sort of a sickness or a disease, or maybe you have pain in your body every day. Maybe you have some sort of arthritis or, or a handicap or or you've gone through mental or emotional pain, maybe a broken relationship or something with your children or whatever, or death, something. And you go through these things, you're supposed to offer up the sacrifice of praise because that's trusting God. Faith has been taught to us so deceptively. This whole name it and claim it thing and in the name of Jesus, for one thing, in the name of Jesus means in covenant with him. It doesn't just mean you use his name like a magic wand. If that's the way that it really means, then, well, like the Bible says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you should be able to go out and tell your tree in your yard to be uprooted and cast into the sea and it should obey you. That's not what it means. Faith means obedience, fidelity, and trust. So in the name of Jesus is referring to in covenant with him. When you are in covenant with him, when you have not taken his name in vain. If you love me, you will keep my commandments in covenant with him. All right. So faith isn't about getting whatever you ask for. It means when you don't get what you ask for, you trust in him, you obey him faithfulness, fidelity, trust, obedience. That's what faith is. 
So you can sit there and do what the apostate church of today does and just sit there and throw around the name of Jesus constantly. You can rail at principalities, which the Bible clearly tells us we're not supposed to rebuke and rail at principalities. God placed them there where they're at for his purposes of law and order and punishment. You go to the Lord, Jesus Christ, Yeshua about those things. Now, demons are different. Demons are different. Principalities are your head honchos. Principalities. Demons are your demons on the earth that do the dirty work. Okay, so that's different. But you can sit there and say in the name of Jesus all day long. And that's not what it means. And covenant with him. Name, mark, memorial, monument, the seal of salvation, seal, the mark of God, the Holy Spirit, sin, iniquity, to miss the mark, miss the mark of the Holy Spirit, miss the mark, you've gone astray, you're on the wrong path, you've fallen away, are you ready to fall apart and let God do his great work in you, or are you still going to continue to believe the false things until it's too late? Are you going to continue to believe all these false messages about the end times, that it's about politicians, it's about the world, the world meaning the kingdom that Satan rules, the outer world, the politics, the government leaders. Oh, and yes, I've had people say to me, well, they are part of prophecy. Yes, they are. They're a smokescreen. They're in your face for a reason. Satan is not stupid. They're in your face to deceive you, just like a magician. In fact, the definition of serpent is rooted in a word that means magician and sorcery. What does a magician do? A magician makes you look at something else so that you don't see what he's doing right in front of your face because you're focused on something else. The Pope, the Illuminati, and all of these other evil things going on in the world, Hollywood and everything else is in your face and blatant as it is for a reason so that you will look at that and miss what you're really supposed to be looking at. The problem is in your own heart. The problem is us. It's us, each of us individually. We need a new heart. We need to plead with the Lord to deliver us from our own sin, from our own fleshly ways and be completely stripped bare and to be completely stripped bare of ourselves so that we can be consecrated and truly set apart, circumcised of the heart. Circumcised means to destroy and cut off cutting off the flesh nature, destroying the flesh nature of our heart and be spotless and clean and prepared and ready, prepared, having the oil. What happens before Jesus actually comes back fully? You see Jesus coming on the clouds, the multitudes of his people with power and glory. They have the power of the spirit, the oil. Their wicks are trimmed. They have the oil. The foolish virgins had to go buy theirs. Well, that means it's not the real oil of the Holy Spirit. We must have the oil. We must produce the fruit. We must truly be stripped of ourselves. So we should be looking at the Lord and looking at ourselves and humiliating ourselves daily before him in prayer, crying out to him to deliver us from our own fleshly evil ways, to cleanse us, purge us, and give us a new heart, the very heart of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Well, that's it for today. This video has gotten quite long and my fire is starting to go out. I don't wanna add more wood to it when I'm getting ready to end the video. It's starting to get very smoky as well because it's going out. 
I just want to say a prayer with you guys real quick, but before I do that, so please stay with me. I just want to remind you, I'm 100% viewer supported. I'm having so much trouble, even on my new YouTube channel. I don't know what's going on, but I'm having a lot of trouble with the censorship, with the shadow banning, and it's just really, really bad. And I'm struggling. I'm struggling a lot with the support to this ministry. I put out a video like a month ago, and thank you to those of you who gave. But now all of a sudden, there's hardly anything again. And this is what I do full-time. This is my full-time job. I don't think many of you out there realize how much time that I pour myself into what I do and studying the Bible, studying the words, making the videos by recording them, editing them, uploading them, circulating them, promoting them. I do a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. And the Bible does tell us that we are supposed to support God's workers. So if you feel led or moved to sow a gift to this ministry, I am in desperate need of your support. I'm barely getting by barely getting by so I could really use your help so please pray about it please consider if these videos bless you make sure that you share them with others because I am censored YouTube removes my subscribers by the thousands they don't circulate my videos they don't advertise them so I need your help with sharing them but I also need your loving support and prayer and also giving so that I can continue reaching people all over the world with the truth. Again, I am in desperate need for your support. So please pray about that. I genuinely appreciate it. And like I just said, don't forget to share these videos. Also subscribe to my new YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash at and that's the at sign truth hunters show again youtube.com slash at truth hunters show and this is very very important when you subscribe you have to click the bell and after you click the bell you have to click the drop down menu and select to receive my notifications or you will not receive anything if you've already subscribed i'm asking you to please go back and make sure that you have done that that's very important God bless all of you. Thank you to those of you who have been giving. I genuinely, genuinely appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to those of you who also support me on Patreon. I genuinely appreciate that. I just lost, I think, two or three Patreon supporters just the other day. So I just want to make sure I let those of you who still support me on Patreon know how much I appreciate you. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes and say a quick prayer here before we sign off. Father God, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, thank you for this time together. Lord God Almighty, I just thank you and praise you that you will get this message out to those who have ears to hear, those who need to hear it, Lord. And Father, we humble ourselves before you, Father, we have sinned greatly, Lord. We have walked away from you, Father. We have lived in the ways of the flesh, Father. Many of us have believed the lies. Many of us are coming out of the deception. Many of us have come out of the deception. But Lord, give us strength, Lord. Give us strength and please help us, Lord. Help us to overcome our fleshly sinful nature, Father, in you and through you and by you, Lord. Lord, just help us to rejoice and to give you praise in the midst of our trials, our persecutions, our sufferings, Father, in order that we could be truly consecrated and receive the power of your spirit, Father, that it would come upon us and we could do great things, Father, in order to glorify you in your name, not for ourselves or of ourselves, Lord. Lord, I just thank you and praise you that you remove any pride, Father, that might exist in any of our hearts, Lord, this isn't about us. It's about you, Father, and we want to glorify you. Father, I just thank you and I praise you. Thank you and praise you, Lord God Almighty, that you forgive us of our sins. 
Father, and just wipe us clean of all these spots and blemishes, Father, because you're not coming for a bride who's full of spots and blemishes. Father, you're coming for a bride who's spotless and clean. Father, just full of you and stripped of the flesh. Father, I just thank you and I praise you, Lord, that you just strengthen each and every person listening to this message. Father, I also thank you and praise you that you're moving people out there. Father, you're moving people out there who hear this message to support what I'm doing, Father. Maybe there's some who can only give right now, Father, and that's all they can do right now, Lord. Or maybe there's some, Father, that you might lay it on their heart to support this ministry regularly. Father, I thank you and praise you. You're getting this message to those people too, and you will move in their hearts to do that, Father. Father, you know my heart and you know everything I do. And I thank you and praise you that you are providing help and help is on the way. Lord God Almighty, we just bless you and glorify and honor your name in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you to all of you. And listen, I really encourage you, study for yourselves. Look up everything I've told you tonight. Study for yourselves. Don't just take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. Go to the Lord. Seek him. Seek him with everything you have. Ask him to teach you his word. Delete everything you've ever learned from your mind and start fresh. Become like a child, which means unlearned, uneducated. Study these things for yourself. It is very important. I cannot tell you how important it is. Study it for yourself. Come out of the deception. Great things are coming. Quit focusing on the evils of the world and the evils that are taking place. Pray for the world, but don't be part of the world. Cut yourself completely off spiritually from the world and the ways of the world. Have no appearance of it. Instead, have the appearance of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, by living in him breathing in him, moving in him. It's about our heart. Everything we do externally that we do that is sinful all comes from the heart. It's a manifestation of what is in the heart. God bless you. Search it out for yourself because then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.